Point speed, that's how SAC could do it. Why don't you give us a short countdown? Three, two, one, turn. When you say turn, we're both going to push in slightly, turn clockwise to the right, hold it for five seconds. This is the Kodak moment. Right. Three, two, one, turn. Turn. Hold it. Five, four, three, two, one. Very good, sir. Release key, launch sequence is started. Which, by the way, the crew cannot stop if everything is going correctly. First light is green, that says launch enable. That tells the crew the correct codes in the butterfly valve lock. It will open, this missile will launch. Next light says batteries activate. On board the missile, two small 28 volt batteries are coming to life. In 28 seconds, that missile is going to be in its own internal power. It won't need us anymore. We're going to get a light that says APS. The auxiliary power system is now operating. A lot of things are happening right now, one of which is that big 760 ton door upstairs is open. Can't see it, feel it, or hear it. But it's just going to the tips of the so now we're in a condition known as silo soft. Guidance goes your next light, which tells the crew that the computer is talking to the missile for the last time. Fuel and oxidizer are beginning to flow. Water is being flooded in for sound attenuation. Very shortly, we're going to hear a klaxon. That's telling us that fire is being detected in the launch truck. Four seconds later, the engines with 77% of maximum thrust, the explosive bolts holding it to the thrust mount, Detonate, freeing the missile to leave the launch stuff, we have lift off. Total time between the captain and I turning our keys and that missile leaving that launch stuff was exactly 58 seconds. Okay, roughly oh, 30, 35 minutes from now, about 6,000 miles from here, target 2 will no longer exist. I can tell you definitively, there is no big red button on this console marked, oops. <coughs> Point thing. There was no way for the crew to communicate with the missile. Once that missile had left, we couldn't call it back. They couldn't retarget it in flight. They could not destroy it in flight. Yes, test missiles had destruct packages with a rain safety off. Operational missiles never did because at some point our adversaries would have learned the technology behind them. Okay. So. And did they fire test missiles from the actual sites? No. None were ever fired from these sites. All of the tests, and there were 51 launches of Titan II, all were done from Vandenberg. They could refurbish their launch ducts in about six weeks, give or take another one. Of those 51 launches, they did achieve an 87% reliability rate because that tested both the reliability and maintenance of the missile, the training of the crew, and it all, all came together. Now, they would pull crews and missiles from sites like this, but they would send them to Vandenberg for the yeah. actual launch. This was one of the sites where they actually pulled a missile and the crew and sent them to Vandenberg. What they would do is they would actually pull a missile, they would select three crews, send them out. All three would be sitting in a launch conference like this. They would all get the launch order. None of the crews ever knew which one actually launched the missile. Oh, oh interesting. Okay. Yeah. But that tests to the reliability of the uh, missiles. And and each silo had its own unique uh, cookie codes and butterfly codes. No. As far as we know, the butterfly valve lock code was probably the same for each site. Don't, we don't know that for sure. Okay. Would have taken, because it would, you know, I mean, it would take them all, all out to send You would have to send same. separate messages to yeah. every That's single right. silo then. Yeah. Exactly. Time is of the essence. Yeah, and because, <laughs> you know, the code you is in. One more thing. Yeah. It's, it's the yeah. gentleman associated with missiles, M6 Skylab, I see your patch, you're in the airport. You with your.